welcome to the People's Forum. If this is your first time here. Okay. All right. We're just gonna stand here and look great. Woo! I like your sweater. It's a great sweater. <laughs> all right, we're all good. All right, hey y'all, welcome. Um, welcome to the People's Forum. If this is your first time here, Super happy to have you here. Can't wait for you to come back. We're a space for political education and cultural work. Um, and if you're joining us online, welcome, welcome. So I'm super excited for our first class, Reading the Grunjise with David Harvey. This is going to be an amazing time for us to really go through and study one of the most foundational texts of Marxist political economy. And there's nothing better than engaging in study together. So I'm really excited to have you all here in person and to our folks online for joining in. We have folks that signed up from all across the world, so this is really, really, really special to us. Um, so as you see here, we have Marxist Companion to the Grandrice, published by David Harvey. So today's a special day because today is the publication date. So huge congratulations to you, David. This is amazing, and we're really honored to have you here. So for folks in person, please, 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 at any time, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll bring the mic over to you. This is your class, so please feel free. If you have any clarifying questions, anytime, just raise your hand. And for folks online, the chat is open, so if you have any questions or comments, just type them on in. Um, so we're really excited, and we're so excited to have you here. And David, thank you, and I'm going to pass it over to you. Well, it's uh, my pleasure to be back here. I haven't been back here for a couple of years now, so it's great. And uh, as usual, there's this uh, slight confusion as to whether we're doing it in person or whether we're doing it on the web or, or what. Um, but I, as it turns out, it's a, a, a rather mixed uh, thing. So I'll probably have to talk more than uh, I had in anticipated because uh, uh, the international audience will probably want to hear what I have to say as, as much as uh, they want to listen to what you have to say in the debate that uh, may then ensue. Now, the Grundrisse is a, a very difficult book in lots of ways. Uh, it's a remarkable book, uh, but it's full of junk. And some of it is kind of impossible to kind of parse. And it's Marx talking to himself, and obviously he had some kind of very interesting ideas about the world, and those come out in the Grand Reset, but also other things get caught up in his uh, pet peeves and his pet uh, uh, anxieties. So I think that uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to try to produce a companion which kind of uh, isolated certain features of the, of the Grundrisse for much more detailed consideration. And uh, there are many comments made about uh, this text, uh, many of them by philosophers, and there's a big debate about Hege Hegel and Marx, and the Grundrisse features very large in, in that. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, incredibly uh, enamored of Hegel. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not a Hegel scholar and I'm not a philosopher, and so many of the themes that get caught up in that uh, don't dis interest me so much. But the person who does interest me a lot is uh, Marx's dialogue with Ricardo. And uh, so it's, if anything, the, my bias in this class is, well, it's the Ricardian side of, uh, of, of Grundrisse that I'm most interested in. Uh, but Marx was also caught up, uh, as uh, happens with Marxists in general, in political movements of various kinds, and uh, found himself uh, pitted against uh, the tradition of French socialism. And the tradition of French socialism particularly took the, poor, the, the, the form of Proudhon. And so Marx periodically in the Grundrisse takes off into some criticism of Proudhon. And, uh, you know, well, that was the text of the time. And if you're interested in it, please go off and read it and enjoy it if you can. Uh, I, I don't enjoy it very much. And when Proudhon comes up, I tend to kind of skip over and say, OK, get me back to the real things I'm going to look at. Because 
which is uh, the, the, the base with, uh, uh, with Ricardo. And the base with Ricardo is largely established, I think, by the uh, very specific analysis that uh, Marx has uh, uh, and, 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 and what he's really trying, one of the things he's really trying to do in the grid research. And I don't want to say this is the only thing he wants to do, but it's certainly one of the things he clearly wants to do, and he wants to do it in great detail. And he, he, he says this, and this is on in the original edition of the Grund Research, page 331. In my edition, it's uh, X1. The exact development of the concept of capital is necessary, since it is the fundamental concept of modern economics, just as capital is the foundation of bourgeois society. The sharp formulation of the basic presuppositions of the capital relation must bring out all the contradictions of bourgeois production, as well as the boundary where it drives beyond itself. And as I say in my introduction, uh, I anchor my reading of the, the Grundrisse around this problematic. How do we understand capital? What is capital? How does it work? How does it function? And Marx goes at this very step by step uh, throughout the Grundrisse and, of course, further in capital and further in theories of surplus value. But here there is um, a, a problem of Marx's method, which I want to alert you with at the very beginning. What Marx does is he tends to approach a problem incrementally. He starts with something where he feels secure and starts to build the argument step by step. He does not like to import into that process concepts which are way, way down the line. So, for example, you will find him in the Grund research saying at some point, oh, uh, this is where interest-bearing capital comes in, but we are not in a position to handle that here. So he then excludes it. So what, what happens is that Marx creates a picture and a dynamic, as it were, of uh, something, but on very restricted basis. And many of the things that he needs to do in the long run uh, are, are delayed until the long run comes around. And of course, in, in the Grundrisse, the long run is a long way, way away, and so he never gets there. So what this means is that his statements about what is capital are contingent. They're contingent with where he is at in his argument. If he is way, way down the line, he'll give you a very sophisticated answer to the question, what is capital? At the outset, he'll give you a very simple answer. And the problem I often have is people who cite Marx often cite it from some page, you know, 50 of the Grundrisse or, 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 or 100 in, in capital or something like that, as if it is Marx's definitive statement. It's not. It's always a contingent statement. It's like saying, at this point in the argument, we can say, and he'll make a statement. But it's not a universal statement. It's a statement for that, what can be said at that point in the argument. So when reading the Grundrisse, you always have to be very well aware of where you are at in the argument. And that then becomes, if you like, the contingency that says, from that perspective, at that moment, Marx can say, a, B, and C, and so you will get a, a certain argument. Now, that is all very well as a general proposition, and it's an, it's an important general proposition. The trouble in the Grundrisse is Marx, obviously sort of working late at night with lots of caffeine and all kinds of things, suddenly has a flash of insight where he goes way, way ahead of where he can possibly be. And these are often brilliant uh, sort of in, incantations about what the world of capitalism is about and how the world of capitalism is working and so on. So, it's, so he, he abandons his, his, his general technique. So when you're reading it, you have to recognize that when he goes off on one of these kinds of uh, fantastic, kind of insightful characterizations of how the world of capital is really working, 
when he does that, uh, it, is in, it is, in a sense, out of uh, line with his general approach. So this is what makes the, 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 the Grundry so, so uh, interesting to read, because you have to be aware where you are in the argument. Is this now a statement where he is actually giving you a, a measured kind of con uh, a measured commentary as to where capital is about and what it's about? Or is it one of those moments where Marx is kind of throwing all caution to the winds and saying, well, from my I sit, it looks like this to me. And, and these are the, some of the most brilliant parts of the, of the Grundrisse. And as, as I mentioned in the text, a student once said to me after reading some of this, he said, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like these brilliant jewels of, of wisdom and, and, and insight that occur at various points in the Grundrisse. But they're all buried in a, in, a, in a mud of dense and often turgid argument. So again, you've got to get used to that. And one of the things I tried to do in, the, in my companion was to put as much of the mud to one side and try to uh, keep with uh, the jewels and also with the, 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 the argument of what is capital and how does uh, capital uh, work. So that is one of the things that I think you should, uh, you should bear in mind. The second thing you should bear in mind, and this is something that only really came to me very late, and, and came when I was writing, write, writing the, the Companion, because I had read the Grundrisse many times, and I'd always taken those jewels and used them in all kinds of ways. But I, I I'd never actually appreciated the fact that the Grundrisse does have a structure. And it has a structure which is, again, important to, reveal, to, to set out at the outset. So I'm going to go against what Marx does, which is to move step by step towards something, to say where Marx actually kind of ends up. Because then you can more clearly see where we are, where some of the steps that gets him to where he ends up. So the end point is terribly important. And the end point is actually contained in this idea of totality. Now, in most of the commentaries on the Grundrisse, I haven't seen much which really talks about the notion of totality. But for Marx, this came critically. And as you will see in the text, again and again, you will come up with the idea of a totality. And Marx has in mind a totality. And he's going to look at the capitalist mode of production, capital's mode of production as a totality. And that totality has within it circulatory processes and different moments. And the analogy I use is to kind of say, uh, think of a human body. And we'll say the human body is the totality of what we're going to look at. And within that human body, however, you see all kinds of different circulatory processes at work. You see the heart pumping blood around, oxygen being taken in by the lungs and getting into the blood and going around. You see, uh, gastroenterologists will be looking at uh, the food supply and, and all the rest of it, and the, the brain, neuro neurologists. And so the body is the totality, but within the totality, there are these different circulatory processes. And then within medicine, of course, each one has its speciality. There is cardiologists for the heart, there's pulmonary specialists for the, for the lungs, gastroenterologists for the, for the digestive system, neurologists for the brain, and you can go on like that. So you would say the totality that Marx is looking at and thinking about when he's in investigating capital, the totality of, ca of, of a capitalist mode of production and capital's mode of production, that totality is something which has within it different circulatory uh, processes at work. And Marx calls these circulatory processes moments. So you have a totality, an internal circulation, and moments within the totality. And in the same way that medicine has all those specialists, so we find, you know, Marxists, there are people who are expert on social reproduction. There are those who are expert on finance. There are those who are expert on uh, labor processes. 
There are those who are getting working on fictitious capital. There are those who are working on the state and, 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 and capital. So uh, there are specialist kind of areas. But Marx's idea all the way through is that always keep the totality in mind and always keep the circulatory processes in mind. And so what I, what I did was to start to say, look, uh, actually what Marx does, even in the Grundrisse, is to start to break up these the circulatory processes. And he talks about, and I, I do this on, on page X, V1, the circulation of commodities through exchange. The circulation of money as money. And interestingly, in that chapter, Marx talks about the circulation of money without talking about money capital. This is that tactic I'm telling you about. That he's, he's looking at money, the circulation of money, as if capital has no impact. In the next chapter, capital will come in, and so we start to introduce capital into the story. But the circulation of money is the circulation of money. And he wants to know what it's about. And, and of course, there's a great deal of bourgeois literature about what is money and how does it work. It's a means of circulation. It's a measure of value. It's a, a, a store of value. It's a medium of circulation and all the rest of it. So we have all of those things we can say about money just as money without actually introducing capital into the story. But ca Marx has to introduce money this way because money has to exist before capital can come into being. If capital suddenly started to try to work and there was no money, it wouldn't work. So capital needs to have, before it originates, there has to be a monetary system. There has to be a commodity exchange system. There has to be even wage labor. All of those things had to pre-exist the rise of capital. What capital does is to come along and take those elements and put them together in a new way. And so that then generates the circulation of capital. So the circulation of commodities through exchange, the circulation of money as money, the circulation of the capacity to labor. Can we have that diagram up on the, I guess, oh, there we are. At a certain point, around page 400, Marx actually starts to talk about these circulation processes explicitly. And one of them is the circulation of labor. And now this is very interesting. Because when you look at it, you say, you know, this is internal to capital as a mode of production. Capital as a mode of production feeds off this circulation process in exactly the same way that oxygen comes into the human body in a particular way. And so everything else feeds off it. So capital feeds off the circulation of labor capacity. And you look at it and you say, let's start with the, with the idea that the labor works, wakes up in the morning in a place of residence. They get out of bed. And then the first thing they have to do is to go out and find a job. So they go into the labor market. So the first moment is the moment of the residence. The second moment is what happens in the labor market. Now, not, it's not the case, of course, that everybody goes into the, all the labor market every day, but everybody who's been in the labor market knows that there's a certain kind of experience which attaches to that. There's competition going on between individual laborers in the labor market. There are all kinds of things being said. You know, laborers try to convince capitalists that they are the right kind of labor for the job that's, that's required. And you don't trust those Hungarians or those Irish or something like that because they're unreliable. So all kinds of things go on in the labor market where rivals get set, individual capacities get, get, get caught up. And, and, and so, so you move from, you know, comfort of the bed and waking up in the morning and you go into the labor market. And if you're successful, what happens is you uh, actually give your labor capacity. You don't give yourself, you give your labor capacity over to a capitalist, who then takes it into the realm of production. So we then find the laborer moving from the labor market into the point of production, in which they do what it is that the capitalist says they can do, because they've sold their labor power as a commodity. And the, the contract of the sale is the capitalist has the right to that labor power, and the capitalist uses it in a certain way to make a new commodity. So the, the, that is, the, if you like, the, 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 the key 
one of the key patterns. And then at that point, you, you, you're talking about a class relation, a class relation between capital and labor, which dominates at the point of production. That class relation does not dominate in the same way in the labor market. It's a different experience. Now, at the end of the week, what happens is the laborer gets a certain amount of money. And then what do they do with their money? And they become a money manager at a certain point. And all kinds of things can happen to them. Uh, at some certain point, uh, the only way they could get their money was through a bank. And they had to pay bankers' fees, and they had to do all that kind of thing. And besides, the, when there was this credit cards and all kinds of things. So lots of things go on in the monetary sphere. And the laborers find that maybe some of the wages, hard-earned wages they got, is stolen away by the financial institutions and financial scams and all kinds of things like that. So, so what goes on in, 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 in the world of, of the laborer having the money and what goes on in terms of money power is another moment in the circulation of labor capacity. Then the, 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 the laborer will go to the supermarket, buy all the goods that needed, buy things, and buy you know, booze and, or whatever. At that point, they, they, they go into the labor market, and they go into the commodity market and start to buy things that they need and want. And this is, I think, a, 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 again, a, an incredibly important experience because there they experience capital as a seller. Capital is selling the stuff, and, 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 and when you say, well, you know, what's going on? Well, there's a lot of exploitation going on. There's a lot of, uh, you know, stuff going on amongst the uh, landlords uh, demanding a great deal in the name of rent, the pharmaceutical companies, use monopoly pricing, and all the rest of it. And, and Marx says an interesting thing about this. He said, when the laborer goes into the labor market, goes into the, in, in, into the commodity market, they have exhausted their identity as worker. They no longer are actually having an experience of a worker. They have an experience of a buyer against sellers. And then after that, of course, the laborer will take some of the commodities back to the place of residence and will cook dinner and you know, use them and all the rest of it. So what you, what you see in the, the, the labor capacity is, is, is a circulatory process with different moments in it. And the different moments actually imply different experiences. Now, the habit in mean, many Marxists is to say the only experience that really matters is the point of production. And that therefore, that is the place that dominates all else. But actually, you know, if you kind of say, what does the working person worry about most? Do they worry most about the kinds of conditions that exist in commodity markets where they're actually being exploited through monopoly pricing arrangements? Is that more important to them than the experience in, 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 in the labor process? What's their experience back in the point of social reproduction? How does that work? So, so what Marx does then is to suggest that the circulation of labor capacity is vital to the reproduction of, labor capa of that labor capacity. And the politics that come out of that are rather, are rather different. The sort of fights that go on around what goes on inside of production, the fights that go on in the, in the labor market, the fights that go on uh, from uh, being cheated and scammed in, uh, in terms of uh, money capacity, the fights that go on when, when you've got to you know, deal, deal with the price gouging and, 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 and all the rest of it. Now, this has a significance politically. Because when somebody comes along and says, hey, we should have a $15 minimum wage, and you say, great, great. And the $15 minimum wage comes along, and what happens? There are all of those predators hanging around, you know, and credit card companies uh, in, 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 in price gouging markets and all the rest of it. In other words, actually capitalists would quite like it, or some capitalists would quite like it if uh, everybody had $15 an hour. In other words, when you start to look at the totality, within the totality, you start to have a rather different political perspective. And actually what you see 
is a, the, the likelihood that workers themselves will put up with lousy conditions of production, provided they have enough money to be able to actually go through the rest of it and get a decent living uh, condition at the, at the point of reproduction, right? You say, okay, I'll put up with, oh, that sort of crap job or bullshit jobs, as Daddy Greville would call them. You put up with all of that because that gives you enough money to be able to be, do what you want to do somewhere else. So that you kind of then start to see that the politics of this becomes uh, a, vital, a vital question. So this is Marx talking then about the, the circulation of labor capacity. And at the same time, capitalists are latching onto it like leeches, both in terms of consumption and also in terms of the marketing and all the rest of it. Capital will, 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 will do that at the same time as capital will, be, of course, be forcing laborers into conditions of exploitation and radical exploitation in, in, the, in the workplace. So you see what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying here? that in order to understand capital as a totality, you have to understand this circulatory process inside of that totality and how capital uses its encounter with this, which is what the next few chapters in Grundrisse are about, how capital uses its encounter within this uh, to, to, to uh, actually produce itself and reproduce itself. So the circulatory processes then are going to be significant. And if we come to the next, next slide. And what Marx does a bit further down the line, and I'm you know, uh, disobeying his habit of just saying, I only talk about the things that really I can talk about now. This is where he ends up. So this is the circulation of capital. Now, it looks a bit complicated, but actually it isn't too complicated. Start at the bottom with the idea of money capital. Somebody comes along and they have some money, because the money is in circulation, and they decide to use it as capital. And what do they have to do to do that? The first thing they do is they go into the marketplace and they, they find some commodities. And two kinds of commodities are significant. One is labor capacity, labor power. The second is means of production, that is raw materials, machines, all that kind of thing. So you go in and the capitalist buys those means of production and, and, and the labor power, and then puts them to work in a, in a labor process, which makes a new commodity. So this is the point of production. So we start with money capital, we then go through commodity commodities, and we then go to the production process. And the production process is, builds another commodity, a different, a new commodity. And that new commodity can be of various kinds. It could be luxury goods, it could be so wage goods, it could be means of production and so on. Uh, so that commodity is then sold for money. The, the, the value, if you like, is realized in monetary form. So you've gone from money to commodity to production to commodity to money. And one of the things that you can do when you do this is you make sure you end up with more money at the end of the day than you did at the beginning of the day. In other words, you're going to do this so that you end up with more, i.e. profit. So the capitalist comes along and says, well, okay, I start with this amount of money. I want to end up the day with that amount of money plus profit. So that is, if you like, the first step. Then there comes a the moment of distribution, which we're not really in a position to talk about very much because in Marx's analysis, because we haven't got to it. But the surplus or, or the value, which is, which is taken in monetary form, gets distributed. Some of it goes to the state in the form of tax. Now, Marx doesn't talk about the circulation of, of, of revenues, state revenues. He should have done. There are times when he, when he mentions it there, and it's actually terribly important in terms of state debt and all that kind of thing. But, you know, some of, it, some of, the, some of the, 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 the money that's circulating gets taken off in terms of taxes. 
Some of it goes in terms of wages, which we've already talked about. Some of it goes to the bankers, who lent money maybe to, to, to the producers, who maybe even lent the money that the capitalists are using at the very start. So they need to get interest on their loan. So they have to be satisfied. So, and, and then so it may be that uh, capitalists have a hard time marketing their product. So they, 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 they employ merchants. So merchants get to market the product. So, and then at the end of the day, there's also the fact that uh, you want to use the land and landlords are going to say, if you want to use my land, you have to pay rent. So you have rent, interest, merchant capital, and, 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 and wages. And, and so this is the distribution, the moment of distribution. And some of whatever's left over, the industrial capitalist who started all of this gets, gets enough profit to keep on doing it. Now, one of the things that Marx does is to say, it's only when this system goes through the whole circulation process and then does it again and again and again that you've really got capital. Before that, you've got exchange, market exchange. You've just got market exchanges going on. And you could have a society where there's lots of market exchanges, but no capital circulation. But Marx kind of says, capital is defined by the fact that it goes from that amount of money to more money coming back again and circuits round and round. In other words, it's not a cycle. And this is a very important thing. It is not a cycle. It is actually a spiral because you've always got to have profit. And if, you, if there's profit, it means there's more money at the end of the day. And if money is an accurate representation of value, which Marx presupposes it is, then there's more value at the end of the day than there was at the beginning of the day. And that, value, that is what surplus value is about. So when you go through this, you, what you see is you see this kind, of, this kind of process. This is what Marx calls the inner structure of capital. And it is what I would call the mode of production. This is the circulation process of the mode of production. And Marx spends most of his time analyzing this in great detail. But go back a minute to the, the human body as a totality. Yes, you can look at the human body as a totality. You can see how it's functioning and how things are supporting it. And you can see that it occasionally breaks down and dies or something. So the human body is, is, a, is a totality. But the human body exists in an environment. And if you want to talk about you know, why people die, then one of the things you have to do is you have to say, well, this has something to do with opioid addiction. It has something to do with they lost, people lost their jobs. Uh, they got depressed and they drank too much and got cirrhosis of the liver and all kinds of things like that. So the bodies don't, it, it can be viewed as a totality, but they're not a totality of everything. And the, to, the body exists in a world where lots of things are going on which have implications for, for the body. You just seen this terrible ter thing in Turkey. Well, well, you know, the body did not die of its own volition almost. No, it gets hit by something. So it, there is an environmental configuration. So that you would never say the only cause of, of death is because somebody's heart stops beating. Or because the neurological processes got compromised. You would always want to ask, what were the social conditions that led to the deterioration of the blood flow or the pulmonary system and so on? What were the environmental conditions? What, what are the environmental, uh, what are the carcinogens that exist in the, the, in the environment? So the body does not, you just wouldn't say, I'm interested in, med the only thing I'm interested in is, is, is the cause of death as it occurs within a body. You want to also know a great deal about the context. And holistic medicine 
and holistic thinking about this would actually appreciate the fact that while the body is a, can be understood as totality in a certain way, so it, it exists in a certain environment. Now, the same thing is true of capital. Capital exists in a certain environment, this circulation of labor. For instance, the social reproduction of the laborer. That's very much about the social reproduction of all kinds of other aspects of, of, of the cultural world. So in this diagram, what we have at the bottom is kind of saying, look, all of this rests on the metabolic relation to nature. And therefore, the metabolic relation to nature is not part of the inner structure, but is part of the outer structure. That, and, and, and the outer structure is itself very often built by capital. Cities get built. Space relations get built. All kinds of things of that kind. So that there's a huge kind of relationship between the inner structure and the outer structure. And Marx tends to use the term for this social formation. So one of the things that I do is, is, to, is to try to distinguish between the mode of production, which is the inner structure, and the conditions in the social formation, which are about the metabolic relation to nature, about building cities, about building places, about building things of that kind. In other words, it's, it's, it's a physical environment. And there's also a cultural environment. How, how much does capital actually rely upon knowledge structures which uh, have been passed down over generations in the labor force? Where does that come from? How about social reproduction? So there's a, there's a language here, which I think it's very useful to, to deploy and say, I, Marx is looking primarily at the mode of production. That is what he's concentrating on, and that is what we're going to end up with, is understanding that and its contradictions more and more. So that is what we, Marx will be really concentrating on. But he is very aware of something called the metabolic relation to nature. He's very aware of all of the implications of place building, of place construction. Of, uh, he's very well aware of all of those things, and, and, and periodically, when he thinks about it, he suddenly goes in and says, well, you know, all of this depends upon human history, the activities, uh, people learning things and doing things. So, so that again, the totality is there, but the totality, in a, in a way, is a bit Chinese doll-like. The capitalist mode of production exists interior to the social formation. And in a sense, the capitalist mode of production is the engine of what happens to capital. It's the engine which is pushing expansion, technological change, dynamism, and all the rest of it. So the capitalist mode of production is the center of this, but there are all sorts of things that are going on in the social formation which are much bigger and much larger and much more complex. But Marx doesn't you know, always get, say, oh no, I can't deal with that here. No, he'll, he'll swoosh in there every now and again and say, hey, we've got to look, think about the social formation in this case. But I think it's useful at the very outset to say when you're reading the Grundrisse, you realize that you are dealing with step-by-step with, with -step revelation of how a totality works and, 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 and how there are moments within this totality, like in the moments of capital are the money moment, commodity moment, production moment, the produce commodity moment, the realization moment, the distributional moment, and then some of that money comes back in as money capital and it goes round and round and round and creates the spiral. That is the totality that we're looking at. And that is the totality as it is actually laid out in the Grundrisse. So it's very important when you're reading the Grundrisse to recognize where you are in this totality which part of it you're looking at. Are you looking at you know, fixed capital? Are you looking at investment in the built environment? Are you, what, are you, what, are, what are you looking at? And, and to me, this creates a structure for, for reading, so that you're always saying to yourself, OK, I'm now at the money point where we're just looking at money, and we're not looking at anything else. All right, now I'm at the point where money is colliding 
with the circulation of labor capacity. And then you go on and you step by step and you start to see emerging something like this as, as Marx continues. It gets more complicated and this is a simple version of the, of the, of the totality, but it, it, it gets you thinking about where, where you are in terms of uh, uh, the analysis. So this is, if you like, where I would uh, want to, uh, em what I would want to uh, emphasize and, and, try, and, and try to use this framework uh, to interpret what is going on in the different sections as they, as they come up as you go on. Uh, there are certain sections which are dedicated, for example, to fixed capital formation and fixed capital circulation. Uh, that is, is, has a context of uh, circulation of interest-bearing capital, and there are various connections of that kind. But once you have it in mind that, okay, what you're looking at is the totality of a capitalist mode of production as an inner structure, then the totality of the capitalist social formation as the totality of everything. And then that leads into, uh, if you like, uh, specific understandings of particular kinds of circulation processes that are embedded within this overall circulation process. So that is where, where I'm, as I say, my ambition here is to, is to start where Marx ends up. So that you can then say to yourself, well, you know, this is where we're going. And this is where we look at one piece of this story, like labor capacity, or, uh, money circulation or commodity circulation. This is where we will we'll look at it. One final kind of comment, and, and this will be probably taken as a bit of a cheap shot in a way. Um, there's been a long history within Marxism of saying what is the cause of crisis? And some people say it's the falling rate of profit. Some say it's overproduction. Some say it's over underconsumption. Some, you know, but uh, Amar Sheikh did a nice story uh, article many, many years ago talking about the different ways in which uh, different theories of, of, of crises. Um, when you adopt this framework, you actually end up with a very different kind of understanding. Uh, you wouldn't say, if, if I asked you, what's more important to you, your heart or your liver? And you say, well, this is a ridiculous question. This is a ridiculous question. Both of them can go wrong. And you can die from heart failure and you can die from liver failure. And there are times when actually the same thing can be said about this. There are times when, and Marx talks about this specifically, each one of these transitions from money into commodities that transitional moment is one of potential blockage and barrier. I mean, if somebody starts out with money and says, yeah, I'm going to, I got this idea, I want to be a capitalist. And they take their money and they go out and there's no labor market, no laborers. End of story, right? And, and, and the same is true if everybody, you go through this whole thing and at the end of the day, you take the commodity into the market and you can't find anyone to buy it. End of story. So what Marx does is to set this up in such a way that you see the continuous flow which can encounter barriers at various points. And each one of those barriers has the potentiality to gum up the whole system. So that we don't end up with kind of saying, oh, the only form of crisis is this, or the only form of crisis is that. We ask the question, where is the primary barrier right now that is gumming up the whole system? And how do you, does that barrier get unblocked? Right? This is because, because, like I say, it's not as if one, one part of your body causes the other part of your 
body to die. You know, it's not like that at all. What, what we encounter here is Marx thinking about a process. And it is a process. Capital is a process, not a thing. Capital is a process of flow, and it's flowing around this system. And you have to understand that the flow can gum up at any one particular point. And one of the things which capital is very concerned to do is to make sure that all of these transition points, all of these moments, are adequately held open. So Marx kind of says capital has to leap over barriers. It has to circumvent barriers within the circulation process. And if it can't find the labor that it needs in its own backyard, it will go somewhere else and look for it. If it can't find the land in its own backyard, it will go somewhere else. So you, you are looking here at a flow model. Capital is a flow. It is a flow that takes you through these different moments. And Marx is very emphatic. The continuity of the flow is, a, is foundational for what capital is about. When the flow stops, the whole thing gums up. I always recall this moment uh, around 9-11. 9-11, everything stopped. All the flights stopped. Everything stopped. There was no flow. And all of a sudden, all of the authorities said, good God, this is the end of capitalism unless we get things started again. So Giuliani came on TV and said, get out your credit cards and shop. George Bush came on and says, get on planes and fly. Because for those three days, the motion stopped. And I think everybody recognized that if it remained stopped, then that was the end of capitalism, then and there. And of course, the purpose of a strike and a general strike is precisely to say, hey, stop. We have the power to stop. So there is, a, there, there is if you like, a way of thinking about this, of saying the continuity and the flow is what capital is about. It's not a thing. In economics, capital is a thing. Conventional economics. In Marx's world, it's not a thing. It's a process. It's a flow. And, and, and again, Marx is going to argue in here, contra the economists, that if you cannot understand capital as a flow, you're going, to, you're going to get things very badly wrong. And it's, it's the case. Every time there's a major crisis under capitalism, nobody knows where it came from and what, what its problem was. 2007, 2008, took everybody by surprise. I said, what the hell, how is this? And Marx has a wonderful comment when he kind of says, you know, when faced with a crisis, the economists typically say this would not occur if the economy only performed according to the principles in my textbook. And they do that. They do that. You know, if they, they, they're great. My model is not wrong. Reality is wrong. You see a lot of that. There was a lot of that around in 2007, 2008. But Marx's analysis is to go, OK, we have to look at this flow. And this is very much what the framework that I want to adopt in, in, in this reading of uh, the Grundrisse. So let me stop just here, and then we all spend a little time uh, going to Marx's introduction, because I wanted to spend some time talking about the general framework, so that you have that general framework in mind when you're you know, dealing you're down in the mud, uh, which uh, you're bound to be at a certain point, I'm sorry to say. But remember, the jewels are always around the corner. They shine very brightly when you get to them. 
So let me just, just pause here and see if there are any kind of questions or comments that people want to make. I'm told, by the way, people get intimidated by me. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't bite. Yeah, right. Um, the red and the green labels um, are very vast in how they're defined here. Yes. The destruction of space and nature. Um, I find it a little bit difficult to understand what is and is not inside of that vast uh, description. So is there uh, examples or um, more concrete uh, instances of those? Uh, I think that, uh, um, for, for instance, you take the general, general principle which Marx lays out, which is to say all of this uh, is caught up in the metabolic relation to nature. So that would be his general, form, general formulation. Now, the metabolic relation to nature is very, very complex. So when you get into it, then you have all the Marxist books about nature and how Marx understood nature and so on. So there is a specialism uh, about that. Um, what what uh, I, would, I would do is to say, well, okay, there are certain problems which exist in the social formation which are, are, are actively can be understood as products of what is going on in terms of the engine of the mode of production. Uh, for example, the mode of production uh, is about growth, uh, and it's about growth, uh, endless growth. In fact, Marx kind of says in Capital, this whole system, being a spiral, is about more and more commodity production. That puts all kinds of stresses on the, on the environment. When Marx was writing, the stresses on the environment were very local. The, the, the problem was, you know, the putrid uh, dwelling houses of uh, working classes in Manchester or, or somewhere. So that was the problem there. We've now got a problem of habitat destruction and we've now got a problem of, of uh, global warming and climate change and all, all the rest of it. So my argument would be, when you understand this and you understand the spiral form, that means you produce more and more and more. You have to extract more and more in the way of uh, raw materials from, the, from out of the bowels of the earth so that you're going to get environmental issues cropping up in our society, which for Marx was not there. Uh, I mean, capital in, in, in 1855 was, industrial capital was confined to you know, a few industrial districts in Britain and, and, and the eastern seaboard of the United States and a bit of, bit of uh, Western Europe, and that was it. So the impacts on, the, on global climate change were, 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 were negative. But if you look at the kind of growth spiral and the exponential growth, what you see is that, you know, after 1950 or 60, you're in that curve of an exponential growth, which is going like that, so that in 1950, the total output, and I trying to remember this exactly, was, was about $9 trillion. That was the total, total of the global economy, about $9 trillion. And it's now close to $100 trillion. It's increased tenfold. And during that time, carbon emissions went up. And during that time, you know, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere shot up to levels not seen ever before uh, over the last 800,000 years. The, from, from all the data. So you get something like that happening, and in which case you kind of say, well, you know, it's a spiral form, it's a problem. Uh, and yes, it's a, big, it's, a, it's a big problem. And the same thing would be true of habitat destruction. As you destroy habitats, because you, you need to, for agriculture and all the rest of it, so you, you actually destroy a lot of the species diversity on planet Earth. So you know those things are there. All I'm, all I'm doing here is to say, well, you know, yes, if you just say, kind of say everything that's out there, 
But one of the things you do is you choose a particular kind of topic and say, well, are we having problems with, um, uh, with climate change? The answer is obviously yes. To what degree are those problems of climate change due to the spiral form are, in, are if you like, a product of the way this system works in its inner structure? Can you solve the climate change problem without altering the inner structure? That's one of the big questions. Uh, capitalist corporations will tell you, yeah, of course we can. My view would be, no, you can't. And so the argument then goes on. Goes on. The, 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 what, the, what the theory does connects to the concrete kind of, kind of, kind of problem. Now, when you get into the details, of the particularities, as Marx would talk about it, you'll find a great deal of variety and a great, you know, and, and it can look overwhelming. And I think I'm, you know, I'm picking up, well, that's, that's the problem here. It looks so overwhelming. But you can pick a problem. Say, uh, I don't know, use of plastics. Where did the plastics industry come from? It, nobody knew anything about plastics in 1945 invented around 1950s, became important after 1970s because they figured out how to put carbonated, enough pressure within the plastic that would take carbonated drinks. And now, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a major source of, I mean, the, the, it's a major source of, of, of global pollution. So what are we going to do about plastics? Again, you find yourself then saying, you know, where did the plastics industry come from? Well, part of it came from the whole kind of question of how to keep the system in expansion from the 1970s onwards. So th th those are the sorts of things that, and, and, I, and I agree with you, you know, the way Marx sends it up just as metabolic relation to nature. But what he's signaling is that you've got to go and look at it and see what the hell's going on. Uh, or he will talk about... Uh, uh, the free gifts of nature and the free gifts of human nature. We'll talk about that. And what does he mean by that? He means the way in which capital does not pay for, for, for example, a lot of the minerals it extracts from the, power, the bowel of the earth. If it does pay for it, it pays for it because the landlords get there and charge a rent. But a lot of this is free, is free gifts of, of nature. And the same thing is true of human capacities and powers. To what degree does capital actually mine cultures? And what does it do to cultures in mining them? And what does it do in ecotourism? And what does it do with cultural tourism and all the rest of it? So there's all of those issues. And, and the point I think that Marx is making is if you have the framework, you'll know what kinds of questions to pursue and how to pursue them. And you will always, at some point or other, ask the question, what's the relationship between what's going on in the social formation and what the laws of motion are in the capitalist mode of production? Because what Marx will do is to come up with certain laws of motion in the capitalist mode of production. And those laws of motion mean that that is what capital has to do to survive. And because capital does those things, it has these implications, for instance, global warming and so on, in the social formation, which are and can be intolerable. At the same time, as of course, it can also do things which make it more tolerable. I mean, it's not, it's not, a, all, it's not all a one-way negative street. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment momentarily on the, the text of the Grundrisse just in the context of the canon of Marx's work. Um, I I'm a little bit confused as to whether or not this was actually ever intended for publication by him or if this was strictly just uh, his own personal notes. And then um, why this text why choose to make a companion to this text over another? Why teach a class on this? 
why is this appropriate to someone who may be a beginner to learning or reading Marx? Um, and what's the significance of this specific text in the totality of his work and understanding it? Well, you know, I'm tempted to give the answer to somebody who was asked why they climbed Mount Everest, and the answer was because it's there. So I'm uh, rather tempted to give that answer. It's a text that's there. But I think most people who encounter it realize that something special is going on in this text. For instance, all this stuff I'm telling you about circulatory processes and moments and all the rest of it is very explicitly uh, dealt with here. And when you go back and you read Capital, you realize how much of Capital is actually informed on that basis, where Mark, but Marx doesn't tell you. See, Marx was, Marx was there, there are two moments, if you like, in Marx's work. One is a moment of discovery, and the other is the moment of, of presentation. Marx was very interested in presentation. When, in writing Capital, he was very aware that all this stuff about Hegel wouldn't go down with the working classes and all the stuff that he's doing here wouldn't go down with the working classes. So he sought a language which he felt could be understood well by uh, self-educated workers, which was his primary audience. And the autodidacts would understand what they would understand. So you read Capital, and a lot of the framework that he describes in the Grundrisse is buried. But when you read the Grundrisse and realize what he's doing, so you suddenly explain, why is it the volume two of Capital is all about circulation? And, and, and how come people have never quite integrated Volume 2 of Capital into Volume 1 of Capital very well? And how would you do that? Well, you understand it better by the framework that the Grundrisse poses. The other thing which I personally find is there are certain issues that are important to me. For instance, uh, I'm a geographer. I'm interested in space, time. Marx and the Grundrisse so is very explicit about how capital changes spatiotemporality. He talks about the annihilation of space through time. Issues of that sort which he doesn't deal with elsewhere. So to speak, so speaking personally, I, I, I find, I've, I've always found some of the ideas in the Grundrisse are extremely relevant to the kinds of studies I was doing on urbanization, uneven geographical development, and the like. In other words, if I was looking for a framework, a theoretical framework, For those uh, issues, I would turn to the Grundrisse. So it just happens to be an important text to me. And uh, I think my work on urbanization has been very much informed by the Grundrisse, more so than capital. Thanks, David. Do you want to take any more questions? If there are some. But if not, I want to go on to... How's the time, by the way, am I? Uh, it's 5.24. Okay. Okay, I want to go on then to uh, uh, Marx's introduction, where some of these uh, themes... And I'm going to go to my original text. As you can see, I've well, well read this text. It's falling to bits. This is about the fifth version of the Grundrisse, I'm on. I've just ordered another one. 
But what I, what I thought I would do then is to go over the Marx's introduction, which, as I mentioned, was not actually written as an introduction. It was a separate piece which got stuck in front of the, 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 main, the main text. And uh, as uh, the, uh, the translator well, points out, uh, Marx himself wasn't very happy with this text. But I think it's possible to see why. And the simple answer, I think, is that uh, Marx is trying to escape, if you like, from the clutches of Ricardo. And in some ways, in the Grundrisse, and people get mad at me when I say this, I see the Grundrisse as Marx actually struggling to release himself from the prison house of Hegelian language and from the prison house of Ricardian formulation. So, uh, and this is rather Ricardian, the, the production, but if you understand that at the outset, then you can read it critically. Now, Marx starts off uh, this with uh, a, a brief comment on uh, individualism and the individual and how important the idea of the individual and individualism is to conservative philosophy, liberal philosophy, John Locke and all the rest of it. And the tendency in those, those people to regard the, the individual as somehow or other uh, having God-given liberties, uh, natural liberties and all the rest of it. And Marx is basically saying, no, individualism came about because of a certain kind of society grew up with commodity exchange which allowed for the formation of individual and individualism. So what people treat as a God-given right is in Marx's view a, a historical social product of the rise of a market society. And this is the theme that he, he takes up here. Uh, and he kind of says, well, actually, uh, the right-wingers have this twaddle, as he calls it, where they do this nonsense of kind of sort of pretending that the individuals existed uh, before anything, and then they, the individuals came together and started to form collectivities, and Marx says history was the other way around. There were collectivities, and the collectivities started to kind of uh, fragment and disperse and started to engage in trade, and when they engaged in trade, they started to create an environment in which it was possible for individuals to survive as individuals but it was a social condition that allowed individualism to survive. And this has a very important political point. Because point. right now, the right wing goes on and on and on about how you know, socialists and Marxists don't, you know, don't believe in individual liberty and freedom. That's absolutely not the case. Marx is very interested in individual liberty and freedom. He's just saying the problem is that we haven't created a, a, a form of production and a form of, uh, of, uh, of economy which will allow individual freedom to truly flourish. Uh, and, and that, you know, and, and this is completely the wrong way, completely the wrong way around. And I, uh, and I, and this will come up again and again in, in, in the Grand Risa. And uh, I'm, uh, the, my best summary of it is, uh, comes from Henri Lefebvre, because uh, Henri Lefebvre, French Marxist, urbanist, sociologist was once once asked why he was a Marxist and not an anarchist. And his answer was, I'm a Marxist, so that one day we can all live like anarchists. And it's exactly what Marx is about. It captures exactly what Marx is about. Because Marx is, is, is kind of saying, you know, the issue is to create a world in which the individuals have, have a, 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 access to the realm of freedom. And we don't assume, and if, every, if, if, if this individual liberty and freedom and so on was God-given and from there from the very beginning, how come we screwed it up so badly? Well, the answer is, of course, it's the state and it's the, 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 the socialists and all the rest of it. But Marx is kind of saying, no, 
individual liberty and freedom is only possible in a world where necessities are taken care of. As he says it in volume three, the realm of necessity is left behind so that you have free, total free time. And Marx frequently comes back in the Grundrisse to the idea of free time. Is the mark of what a socialist society was to be about. And so this is, if you like, the opening salvo in here is kind of saying, you know, the origins of liberal theory is in a fantasy. And it's a fantasy that uh, individualism is natural rather than socially created. And he uses the kind of example of Robinson Crusoe, which was also used in Capital. Uh, Robinson Crusoe, was Defoe's fable um, about you know, what happened to uh, somebody who got uh, shipwrecked on an island and then uh, was trying to figure out how to survive on the island and invented an economy that looked surprisingly like 18th century capitalism. And, and uh, Marx kind of says, well, you know, he recovered from the, sh the, the wreckage uh, as a pen and paper and pencil and could uh, act like an 18th century businessman. So Robinson Crusoe was, was, was good. Uh, a fable which uh, many economists referred to as kind of the naturalization of individualism. Of course, uh, Robinson Crusoe ended up finding there was somebody else on the island, which was Man Friday, who was a kind of a colonial subject, and so all those kinds of things come in. Uh, Defoe, by the way, is a very fascinating person to read on all of this, because the, uh, he, he actually set up uh, a whole series of novels, uh, and I, I really kind of found, uh, as I say in, the, in my version of the text, if you, if, you know, if you want to look at uh, some of the social relations that were really going on, then, then you would uh, look at some of his other novels. Now, uh, what Marx does in, so Marx is doing this, and you can read about that as you, as you want to. Um, what Marx does is then to talk about uh, uh, production and distribution in general. Uh, and his, the issue here is this, that there are certain categories, which is again a, a theme that is going to echo throughout the whole Grundrisse. There are certain categories which uh, actually apply to all modes of production, no matter what. Uh, for example, the category of labor, there's, there's no mode of production that doesn't have labor of some kind going on. Uh, and appropriation of uh, nature. Uh, so what Marx is concerned with here is to say, I want to know, his question is, I want to know what the specific qualities are of a capitalist mode of production. Yeah, okay, there's going to be labor, the, the, the going to be appropriation of nature and all the rest of it. Um, and there's going to be some kind of notion of possession. Uh, and he makes the point that, you know, the tendency, of course, is to say, Property is important, but yeah, property is important if you treat it property as possession, uh, but that doesn't mean private property necessarily. And he talks about the way in which uh, actually historically most of the property rights were specified as common property rights, uh, as collective property rights of, of that kind, the right to appropriate uh, the, the natural world and, uh, and, and engage in the metabolic relation. Uh, and so, so the, 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 in, this, in these first pages, uh, he, he kind of, kind of wants to, to make very clear that the, the, the categories that he's running with have a specific meaning within capitalism that they don't have within feudalism. This is particularly going to come out with the question of land rent. Land rent under feudalism was very different from land rent under capitalism. When you 
take something like land rent and bring it into the capitalist mode of production, it turns out to be very, a, a very different beast. Uh, uh, but the category of land rent is still there in both modes of production. Labor is there in all modes of production. Appropriation is there in all modes of production. So there is the question of what is it that all modes of production have in common and which can be talked about as in common, and that would include capital because capital would have these modes. Of production. But how are, what are the specific categories that distinguish the capitalist mode of production from socialism or anarchism or liberalism or conservatism or whatever. So this is, a, this is the question he's, he's asking. And in the course of that, he immediately comes up against uh, some of the theorizing that has gone on. And, and in particular, he's very, he's very annoyed at John Stuart Mill. Because John Stuart Mill uh, took the way that production is something which is, quote, naturally ordained, naturally set up, and that therefore there is nothing that society can do about production which is somehow or other different from what is already going on. So production was universal, and production was also natural entirely natural. But, says Mill, distribution is not. Distribution is social. Distribution is, as he says, uh, and this is on page 87 of my version of uh, uh, Grundrisse, uh, he says that uh, the aim is rather to present production, see for example John Stuart Mill, as distinct from distribution, as encased in eternal natural laws independent of history, at which opportunity bourgeois relations are then quietly smuggled in as the inviolable natural laws on which society in the abstract is founded. In other words, what he sees John Stuart Mill doing is disguising bourgeois relations as if they are natural, but they are relations of production which are natural. So that Mill kind of says, no, it's, we're just dealing with nature. And Marx is saying, no, but hidden within your account of nature is the conception of bourgeois society. You're smuggling in the bourgeois stuff in production. And of course, Marx wants to revolutionize production. He's not content simply with redistributive socialism. John Stuart Mill was an advocate of redistributive socialism and very strong advocate of that. And it's interesting reading Mill and, and about redistributive socialism and what it's about. It's a bit like reading sort of Bernie Sanders or Piketty or, or, or even Elizabeth Warren today. I mean, they're, they're, they're very much about redistribution. And, and Adam Smith was about redistribution. Adam Smith was in favor of a free market economy which generated a great deal of wealth for the state. But he then said, it's up to the state to redistribute it equitably. That part gets always left out of the Smithian uh, account because he basically was saying, let the individual entrepreneurs uh, alone, let them get on and they'll create all the wealth and then you, that'll give you the tax base on which to, to redistribute. So this was, was Adam Smith. So redistributive socialism is very much on the agenda. And it was on the agenda for one very, very simple reason, which does go back also to Ricardo, which is because of the labor theory of value. Ricardo worked with the labor theory of value. Marx takes up Ricardo's theory of the labor theory of value and, and modifies it in certain ways, which we may get to as we go on. Modifies it in certain ways. But the thing about the labor theory of value was it had attached to it a moral conundrum. If labor is the source of all value, which is what the labor theory of value declares, then how come the laborers get so little of it? Right? They make the, they make the goddamn value and the capitalists steal it, which is, you know, Proudhon properties, theft, and all that kind of stuff. 
So, so the labor theory of value, because it is, it says in effect, all value is due to the application of living labor to production, had that moral kind of conundrum attached. And the result was the whole school of Ricardian thinkers in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, who were saying basically, look, this is wrong. This is morally wrong. They're the ones who, you know, so we need to redistribute it. And, 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 and that, of course, connected very much with John Stuart Mill. Now, John Stuart Mill was at the apogee, if you like, of that Ricardian socialism, which working with the labor theory of value said, labor is the source of value. We allow the entrepreneurs and everything to organize production in the way they do because that is natural and so on. But then we take the wealth that is generated and we redistribute it our, on an equitable basis as far as we can. So that is what we should do. That's what they were beginning to argue. Well, the capitalist entrepreneurs, the capitalist owners didn't like that. They, they, and, and one of the, they, they, they detested the labor theory of value. So then came along in the middle of the century uh, an alternative theory of value. And this was the value, a value theory based on the marginal productivity of the different factors of production. The whole marginalist economics, which came in the 1850s, 1860s. And the point was to say that the, the value was created by the, margin, the contribution of the different factors of production. And the value of those different forms of production depended upon their relative scarcity. And, and if capital was scarce and labor was abundant, then that fully justified paying labor very little and paying capital a lot. Right? So the, the, the theory of value as, as, as the marginal contribution of the three basic factors of production of land, labor, and capital was very convenient to the capitalist class. Because finally now they said, well, we're getting a lot because capital is scarce. Labor is abundant. The laborers re re reproduce too much. There are too many laborers around. Too many workers around. You, you're profligate. You have too many kids and all kinds of things like that. So they ended up, you know, abolishing the moral question after 1850. And by the time you get to 1890, everybody's forgotten about the... And of course, if you say today, the labor theory of value is a good idea. Imagine what it would, people would say in an economics department. You're kind of, you're out, out of your damn mind. Labor theory of value, what? No, we know that was all junk. Well, it was all junk because it actually led to Ricardian socialism. And with a, with a strong moral justification and a strong material justification. But then it got abolished by the marginalist revolution in economic theory and the, 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 the explanation of value in terms of the marginal productivity of land, labor, and capital as distinctive factors of production. So John Stuart Mill then is uh, the apogee of this. But Marx, of course, was kind of saying, well, it's not about, you know, we've got to get away from this fact that labor is uh, where, where, where it's at. We've got to get away from uh, this, this idea that somehow or other production is natural. It's not. Production is social from the very beginning. And therefore, we have to understand its sociality and where its sociality came from. And the labor theory of value, of course, emphasized some of that. What then Marx does is to say, OK, let's look at this now. And he opens the second section on the general relation of production to distribution, exchange, consumption with the argument. It is necessary to focus on the various categories which the economists line up next to it. Now there's a, there's a bit of confusion in what follows. Is Marx talking about how he interprets the world or is he giving an account of how classical political economists 
interpreted the world. My argument would be, and this statement, when he counters it, I will we have to focus on the various categories which the economists line up next to it. Marx is not talking about his own view. He's talking about what the economists do. Now this leads to misunderstanding because what follows, there are all sorts of strange things that follows. And if you say these are Marx's views, you get him completely wrong. He's saying these are the views of the economists. And this is my critique of the views of the economists. My views are radically different. But he doesn't tell you what they are. So you don't know what the alternative views are. And that's going to come at the end of the, of, of the Grundrisse. Uh, and he puts, he says this, he says, okay, let's look at these different moments in the circulatory process. The production moment, distribution moment, exchange, and consumption. So he's got four moments there. And he then says, these form a regular syllogism. Production is the generality, distribution and exchange the particularity, and consumption the singularity in which the whole is joined together. This is admittedly a coherence, but a shallow one. Now, syllogism, hierarchical organization, in which production is considered the generality. That's the John Stuart Mill position. It's, it's, it's distribution and exchange, the particularity. So you have the generality and the particularity, and then consumption, the singularity in which the whole is joined together. Singularity is a strange, strange word to introduce here. Uh, but what it, I think, really means is that this is the moment where everything collides and disappears, implodes. The singularity <laughs> in physics is about an implosion moment. And, and consumption, the commodity disappears. You eat it. So it disappears. It disappears from the thing. So it's a singularity because it is the moment at the end where, yeah, okay, you eat it and it's gone. So it's the moment of implosion, if you like, of the commodity. And then he says, production is determined by general natural laws. This is not Marx, this is, this is John Stuart Mill. Distribution by social accident. And the latter may therefore promote production to a greater or lesser extent. That is, if you dis when you distribute some of the value, as in this diagram. And if all of it flows to, say, the merchants, and none of it goes to the bankers, then that has a, an impact back upon the whole system. So how the distribution works and the, who gets what in the distribution matters in terms of this dynamic. And then he starts to say, well, you know, let's do a the next section, let, let us do an analysis of this. How do you separate production from consumption? To begin with, production is a form of consumption, right? The producer consumes raw materials, energy, all the rest of it. So production is consumption. So why are we saying there's something over here called production and something over here called consumption? That's, 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 that's a nonsense. They are two moments, perhaps, but they're bound together. So that he says consumption is also immediately production. There's something called productive, uh, consumptive production and, and productive consumption. Consumptive production is the producers are actually consuming the output. So if, if I'm producing car parts, then my car parts are consumed by the car manufacturer. So they are consuming what I have produced. So, so Marx starts to play games with all of this. And, and, and I, I'm not going to go through them all because, you know, 
after a while, your head starts to whirl because production is consumption, is consumption, is part of it's everything. But again, Marx uses the language of moments. The act of production, he said, says, is therefore in all of its moments also an act of consumption. So this then goes on for several pages, and, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting to read because basically what he's doing is saying all of these categories which economists treat as being separate from each other actually are, 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 are internal to each other. You can't have production without consumption, and you can't have consumption without production. That's a nonsense. And therefore you've got productive consumption and consumptive production and all the rest of it, these things. Uh, and he then goes on, I just want to read you a bit of this passage. Not only is production immediately consumption and consumption immediately production, not only is production a means of consumption and consumption the aim of production, consumption is also conceived as an object of production I mean, each of them, apart from being immediate the other, and apart from mediating the other, in addition to this, creates the other in completing itself, and creates itself as the other. Well, go on. We can have a lot of fun with this one. But it's about, but it's about they are each other's other. And you can't, and, and, and so, so what Marx is doing is taking the categories of classical political economy, running them together, and to say, look, a, they're nonsense. And then he kind of says, well, it goes on further. Uh, and I'll go to the, uh, the conclusion, just so that you can go back and read everything that goes on in between, because it goes on in that vein that I've already con concluded. The conclusion we reach, he says, is not that production, distribution, exchange and consumption are identical, but that they all form the members of a totality. Okay, this is on page 99. They all form the members of a totality, distinctions within a unity. The flow is the unity. There are distinctions within the flow. So this is Marx beginning to extract, his, I think, some of his own meaning. Production predominates not only over itself in the antithetical definition of production, but over the other moments as well. Production predominates over itself. Well, it's interesting, because what is being produced at that moment of production? One thing is, you are producing a commodity. A thing, which is going to be sold in the market. But you're also producing profit, surplus value. Which is more important to the capitalist, producing the commodity or producing the surplus value? You produce the commodity in order to get the surplus value. So it's the profit you're after, right? And if you're after the profit, you've got to produce the surplus value, which means you've got to produce a commodity that in congeals surplus value within itself. And that has to be done through the act of production. So again, this is, these are distinctions within a unity, distinctions within a process. Then he goes on, the process always returns to production to begin anew. That is, you go through again, again, and again with the spiral form. That exchange and consumption cannot be predominant is self-evident. Likewise, distribution is distribution of products. While as distribution of the agents of production, it is itself a moment of production. A definite production thus determines a definite consumption distribution and exchange, as well as definite relations between these different moments. It's the relations between the moments which Marx is after. 
Admittedly, however, in its one-sided form, production is itself determined by the other moments. For example, if the market, i.e. the sphere of exchange, expands, then production grows in quantity and divisions between its different branches become deeper. A change in distribution changes production. You know, this is where we start to see the tautologies that Marx talks about, the tautologies building. Finally, the needs of consumption to determine production. Mutual interaction takes place between the different moments. This, the case with every organic whole. Right. The word whole here is totality, of course. But it's organic. It's not mechanical. It's organic and it's growing. It's like an ecosystem. Now, this is very different from some other mechanical notions of totality that look like a machine engine or something of that kind. This is a, a biological, an organic whole, an organic totality which is expanding, growing, pushing. And it's the continuity of this process. And you look at this and you say, oh, yeah. There is a moment of production which we can talk about, but the, that moment of production, we can't understand its meaning by taking it out of the whole total of totality of, of movements and moments. So this is, if you like, what Marx is, is doing here. He's beginning to say, okay, I'm going to use these terms like production, consumption, exchange, you know, and, and, and the like. I'm going to use these, but I can't use them in the way that classical political economy uses them. Because classical political economy assumed they were separate entities and that the entrepreneur came along and put the three together or put the four together or whatever. No, what we have is, is a process with different moments in it. And those moments are critical for creating surplus value, which can be appropriated by the money capitalist who starts the whole thing. And that is where the spiral form comes in. So this is his argument he's making here, and, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a critique of classical political economy. And it's, I think, a, a very, a, a very a profound one. But again, you're not going to get the critique unless you recognize that when Marx talks about the syllogism and all the rest of it, he's not talking about his own way of thinking of things. He's talking about classical political economy, and the way they set things up. And he starts to dismantle that and then say all of these concepts like production and consumption have to be understood in relationship to the totality of the circulation processes. They are moments within that circulation process, and each moment relates to the other moments. Which comes back to what I was saying earlier. Any one of these moments can be the point of, of you know, stoppage. Any one of them. This leads to the third thing where Marx talks about the method of political economy. And this is a, Marx doesn't talk about his method very often. This is one of the rare cases when he does. And my sense of it is that he's always uncomfortable talking about method because he's very nervous about people taking a method and standardizing it, if you like, and saying, oh, well, this is what you do. Uh, he, he's, he's living in a much more complex world so he wants to be very cagey about his method. My own view is that you learn Marx's method by watching him do it. You learn from watching him work. And in some ways, I've been trying to give some sense of how he works through his critique. And that, that uh, I think, is uh, just 
a very interesting way in which to think about his method. But what he tries to do here is to actually uh, describe certain aspects of his method in some, in some detail. And I think that uh, one part of his method is to kind of say, how do we discover things and how do we present things? And uh, as the opening, he does this. It seems, he says, correct to begin with the real and the concrete. With real precondition. Thus, to begin in economics with, for example, the population, which is the foundation and subject of the entire social act of production. However, on closer examination, this proves false. The population is an abstraction. If I leave out um, the classes of which it is composed, these classes, in turn, are empty phrase if I am not familiar with the elements on which they rest, e.g. wage, labor, capital, etc. These latter, in turn, presuppose exchange, division of labor, prices, etc. For example, capital is nothing without wage, labor, without value, money, price, etc. Thus, if I were to begin with the population, this would be a chaotic conception. Remember the phrase chaotic conception. He's very nervous about hitting chaotic conception. So what he does is he says, you know, it's, population is just doesn't mean anything. It's a chaotic conception until you start to break it down and look at the classes and look at all those things. And when, as you break it down, so the concept of population starts to become less and less relevant. And then he kind of says, from the imagined concrete towards ever thinner abstractions, lead me to the simplest determinations. You start with population, what happens is people go down further and further and deeper and deeper into the elements that comprise population right the way down to, I don't know, ethnicity, religion, all kinds of things of that kind come into the picture. And then he says this, from there the journey would have to be retraced until I had finally arrived at the population again, but this time not as the chaotic conception of a whole, but as a rich totality of many determinations and relations. If you start with the population, it's a meaningless kind of concept, and you start to go down further and further and further. Once you've got down, which is what it might be called the method of discovery, you start to come back up, taking all of the concepts you've got from underneath, and you reconstruct the idea of population in the light of those underlying things which you've established through your inquiry. It's a method of descent and the method of ascent, as he calls it. And the method of ascent is, he says, the true scientific method. But you can only get to that true scientific method by doing the descent first. So his method, therefore, is, okay, start with something concrete around you and, and go down deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper well into all of the differentiations that exist, all of the determinations, then bring, come back to the surface. Irrigate, if you like, the surface. It's like going down a deep well. Bring the water back to the surface and irrigate the surface with your findings. Which is, by the way, one of the lessons I give to people writing PhDs. That's what you have to do. You have to go down a well, get all of your things together and then bring it back up. And there are those people who go down a well and you never see them again. But then the point is, as Marx says, to bring all of those things back to the surface where you now understand population as not a chaotic conception. And he goes on to say that uh, this is not a chaotic conception. But, he says, you now understand the population 
as a rich totality of many determinings, determinations and, uh, and relations. Again, this comes back a little bit to what you were asking. You know. When you've got all of this stuff together, in terms of this conceptual apparatus, and the purpose of theorizing, if you like, is, is precisely to be able to, to come back to understand what's going on in the population at a different level. And that is the method of ascent. And as he says, uh, uh, this is very specific. Um, this also leads, however, to something terribly important, which is the notion of abstraction. What Marx is doing is saying, we're dealing with totalities. But in order to deal with totalities, we have to be prepared to abstract them. I've abstracted the human body as one way of thinking about totality. I abstract the mode of production. I abstract the social format. And, and, and this allows me conceptually to grasp what is going on. And that is what the Grundrisse is trying to do, is to conceptually grasp what is going on in terms of what capital is about and how it works. So the introduction then is very much about doing this, there are other issues that arise in the introduction. I don't know, I think we're probably out of time, right? Well, it's the time. Yeah. We've got about a few more minutes. Um, uh, but I'm going to stop here and then ask if you have any immediate questions about, about, about this. One of the things we can do is... Um, you can go back and look at the stuff we've done, and next week we can have a sort of brief five or ten minutes on any questions that arise as you do that. Right? So, are there any questions? Yeah? I think you need. You mentioned. Um, it's not on. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. You mentioned uh, part of the critique is the Ricardian socialists, and then you talked about the marginalist revolution. So, is both of these camps uh, Marx's target in his work? Like Marx is also engaging with the marginalists, and also trying to refute their positions as well as the Ricardians? Uh, he doesn't directly take on the marginalists. Mm. He does take on the idea that value is constructed out of the three major land, labor, and capital. Because mm. actually Adam Smith's theory of value, has, Adam Smith has a labor theory of value, but he also has the idea that you add up the value of land, labor, and capital as a theory of value. So Adam Smith has... Uh, that it, it doesn't use the marginalist argument. So Marx does critique Adam Smith on that. But, but not the marginalist uh, thing, uh, revolution directly. But he was, he was aware. It was happening at the same time as kind of rise. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see him as terribly aware. It wasn't as if he was reading the economic journals and things like that. Any others? Okay, well, next week I want to go to uh, the chapter on money, which um, is um, heavily influenced by Critique of Proudhon, which uh, I systematically uh, avoid. Um, and uh, you don't have to follow me on that if you want to get into it. Be my guest. <laughs> um, but 
like I said, this is largely going to be a thing about how does money circulate and what are the consequences of monetary circulation independent of before we get to the way in which money is used as capital. So remember that that is the context in which this chapter will unfold. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah? So you mentioned that at a certain point in this text, he says, okay, now before we go any further in the analysis of production, we need to see what the presuppositions of the economists are. Um, prior to him making that statement, is he more uh, straightforwardly talking about his views? Or because it seems like he's still discussing the economists even before that point. But I'm wondering if, if you think that like prior to that, maybe there's some point we should pay attention to that he's revealing uh, his own cards uh, prior to that point. Well, there is... There is uh uh, uh, a discussion <coughs> of where his own thinking runs in the economic and philosophic manuscripts and some of the texts previous. But they were not really informed by a very detailed investigation into the Ricardian system and what it was all about. Uh, this was informed very much by his investigations into the Ricardian economists. Uh, so yeah, he had a, some general ideas. But like I said, they're back in, uh, uh, in the economic and philosoph philosophic manuscripts. Um, but there he doesn't sort of say, hey, I've got to go off and read the uh, Ricardians uh, in any detail. He, he decided to do that somewhere in the 1840s towards the end and then started, then, then started to develop his own idea, ideas through a critique. And I think, again, there's an interesting sort of question of how much his critique really takes him away from Ricardo, or whether Ricardo is still lurking, as, as it were, in his consciousness. And I think this comes about most strongly in the kind of theory of value. He adopts Ricardo's theory of value, but he never entirely overthrows it. Uh, certainly not in the Grundrisse. In the Grundrisse, he tends to fudge it quite a bit. Uh, in Capital and various other places, he starts to articulate it uh, in a different kind of way, but then he, he leaves the stuff alone. So the question of whether he wanted to stick with the labor theory of value or whether the labor theory of value was too problematic, there comes a point in Grundrisse where he sees it as too problematic or starts to see it as too problematic, but therefore it has to be written. But the question is, does that mean the abolition of the labor theory of value in his thinking? Or does it mean uh, that it needs to be uh, reformulated? My own view is uh, I like to reformulate it. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would like to get back onto that moral terrain, uh, which comes out of the day. Yeah, if labor produces all the value, why the hell are they getting so little of it? And why is it all going to you know, Elon Musk and a few people like that? You know, this is, some, something, you know, that's kind of an interesting moral ground there. And of course, economists don't like putting arguments on moral ground. They want scientific ground. And what the marginalist theory did was to give them a scientific ground on which to base their theory of value. And Marx is, of course, very concerned about remaining on unscientific ground, but he wants, he wants his cake and eat it on, on that. Perfect. Thank you so much, David, for okay. a wonderful first class. And thank you all for coming out. I'll see you again next week on Tuesday at 4.15. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Can those people who are uh, in this for credit, um, we need to keep a record of you being here. Maybe you could you, you check, check in. So you check in people. Um, and okay, the people doing that for credit, how many of you are doing it for credit?